Hi guys and welcome back to my channel. So for those of you who are new around here, my name is Sonia and I make motherhood, lifestyle and Iceland related content under the name of Iceland Family Life. I am originally from Scotland. I moved to Iceland four years ago now. I'm married to an Icelander and we have an almost two year old daughter together. And today I'm sharing the long overdue story of Mia's birth. Admittedly, this was two years ago, almost two years ago now. So yes, it's not exactly fresh in my mind and our minds play amazing tricks on us. But I have this all written up on my website. So if you want to go and check out the full story there, it'll be linked in the description down below. If you haven't subscribed already, please make sure that you do and click the notification bell so you don't miss out on any other videos. And I'm gonna get stuck into the story. It all happened early morning of the 21st of June 2018. At 4.15 in the morning, I woke up in our bed and I thought, I think I need the toilet. I'm just gonna go to the toilet. I got up, I waddled through to the toilet. I think my first thought probably was that I'd just lost control of my bladder or something because there was just water coming from me. Sleepy Sonia finally woke up and realised that my waters had broken. It's a very strange feeling because it is like you've just lost control of your bladder and it just kind of slowly trickles out of you. It's not like a gush like it's shown in the movies or anything. I didn't get nervous, I just got more and more excited which was quite strange to me because I thought I was going to be quite anxious about all of this but I got more excited. It took me maybe about 45 minutes to kind of get to the point where I could get off of the toilet because the waters were coming quite slowly. But I do remember a really cheesy moment where I got up, I looked at myself in the mirror and I said, this is the day you can do this. You're gonna have a baby today. 5.20, a little while later, I went through to Ingmar who was asleep in bed. I sat down beside him, tapped him on the shoulder, woke him up and said, babe, we're gonna have a baby today. He asked what he needed to do and I naively, I guess, asked for two paracetamols. I took my two paracetamols and that was actually the only drugs that I had apart from gas and air throughout the entire birth. The contraction started pretty much as soon as I was back in the bedroom. I decided to lie down in bed because I just thought I'm gonna make myself as comfortable as possible and at that point in time I just wanted to lie down. So I lay down on my side and the contractions were, well, I mean, this was my first birth, I didn't really know, but to me, the contractions were quite strong. So we started timing them using the Pregnancy Plus app. The contractions themselves were very much like Braxton Hicks contractions, which are kind of just like really strong period pains. My lower back and slightly at the top of my tummy, but not too much. It was, it was very much like period pains. It's really hard to say because you have no idea what your contractions are gonna be like. And of course, every single labor and delivery is different for every mum, every baby. <laughs> From one to the next, it's completely different. And so that's, that's why it is kind of important to just be open and aware to all of the different stories that are out there. And that's kind of why I want to share my story with you because when I was expecting Mia, I also watched a lot of sit down videos and birth stories and birth vlogs but a lot of them are more on the positive side and I'm not saying that I have a, have a negative story or anything. It's possibly a little bit more honest and revealing of what can happen. It wasn't as smooth as I maybe expected it might be. When you read up on contractions and what will happen or is meant to happen, the stage where you're supposed to phone the hospital and when you're supposed to go into the hospital and all of those kind of things. It didn't really feel like that's what was happening for us. My contractions were very much all over the place and they were really long and strong and quite close together. I was just listening to my body and doing what felt right to me. We decided quite quickly into my labor that we would phone the hospital just to let them know that my water had broken, what the situation was, and just get a bit of advice from them as well. I think there's no harm in just calling to ask. They were really great with Ingmar on the phone, so it was very reassuring to us. When he hung up from calling the hospital, he said to me, should we call your mum? And bearing in mind, we're in Iceland, she's over in Scotland, 
And I thought, it's 6.20 in the morning, let's not bother her. But actually, of course we needed to. We phoned Gran, um, or Gran-to-be, and she immediately hopped straight on EasyJet to find a flight and get herself booked on a flight over here. So it was very exciting for her. And also, my brother's daughter is also born on the 21st of June. It meant that we were gonna have two girls on the same birthday. So she would have granddaughters with the same birthday. In the run up to going into labor, <laughs> I did do a lot of research. I read a lot of blog posts and articles on hypnobirthing, birth affirmations, positive af affirmations, all of those kind of things, but none of them really stuck with me. And when I was actually in labor, <laughs> none of them were coming to the forefront of my mind except this one breathing exercise, which I had literally watched a 20 second video on. And that's the one that just stayed with me. And so it was breathing color. And that's basically what I did the whole way through labor. I would breathe in a color, whatever color it was, and then I would breathe out really slowly the hue of that color until it completely faded and there was no color left. And I still use this breathing exercise now if I feel anxious and stressed or any kind of pain or anything like that, then I go to this breathing exercise. So that stayed with me. I know you're supposed to labor at home for as long as you possibly can. And I probably labored for almost four hours before we actually moved on to the hospital. I did make up a music playlist, relaxation, and then a kind of active labor let's get this party started kind of energizing playlist, which was suggested by the midwives when we were planning our hospital bag and all that kind of thing. But I don't think at any point we actually played it. I think we maybe did at home, I put on the relaxation one when I was in bed, but then we made all the phone calls and things. So it just kind of went out the window. There's a lot that you do in the lead up to labor and delivery, especially for your first one, for your second one, imagine you just have it and that's it you got no time to focus on any of this kind of thing but the first labor i had the hospital bag packed i had things for ingmar i had our playlist i had all sorts of different things and of course they all stayed in the bag and we hardly used anything but i might do another video on a realistic hospital bag soon i had literally no idea how i would progress ingmar didn't really know what to do i didn't know what to do other than just to keep breathing and stay calm and just go with it and let my body take over and I trusted my body I knew it knew what to do and that baby would come when and how baby was going to come and there wasn't a huge amount we could really do about that and it was happening <laughs> and so I just kind of went with it and I was quite relaxed and excited about the whole thing I didn't really think that's how it was going to be so that did surprise me I was very quiet in my labor as well I hardly really spoke the whole 13 hours which I think for Ingemar is quite a surprise as well <laughs> I did laughably ask for a cup of tea and toast because I thought when is the next time that I'm going to eat I'm going to need some fuel in me but by the time Ingemar had come back with the cup of tea the contractions were so close and so hard and intense that I, I said to him, I think we're gonna have to actually go to hospital now. So he called them up again, gave them an update and they said, yeah, just come in, we'll check her over and then we'll decide from there. 8.30, he went downstairs, made sure that the hospital bags were in the car, the car seat was fitted and everything was sorted. He brought the car to the front door so that I would be able to get straight in. And I tried to get out of bed and get myself dressed, which again, looking back is laughable because when I got up, I was still leaking some waters. I was really struggling between contraction to actually get into a pair of trousers or whatever. I was not really able to do much. So I got my Ugg slippers on, Ingemar's light gray tracksuit bottoms, which in hindsight, as you are leaking waters, <laughs> trying to get down the stairs and get into the car is a really bad idea. And a maternity top so I looked all right on the top half but on the bottom half I just looked an absolute disaster it was not exactly the outfit I'd planned to go to the hospital in it was a weekday it was a Thursday so there was the morning traffic but actually by the time I kind of got myself together and was able to get downstairs and into the car rush hour was over so luckily we avoided that 
The hospital is only 10 minutes away from where we stay. 10 past nine, we were arriving at the hospital. The driver was fine. When you step outside of your environment, naturally your contractions start to kind of ease off a little bit. It's kind of a pro and con situation. It did help in getting me to the hospital because I only had maybe two contractions the whole way there but it did slow down labor slightly. I remember being at a set of traffic lights and having a contraction and having to kind of lift myself off of the chair to be a bit more comfortable and hold myself up whilst my body was contracting and then a car pulled up beside us and they were looking in the car so I had Ingemar's dressing gown over me and I lifted the hood and just hid under it. It was not exactly one of the best situations I've been in but whatever, <laughs> we got to the hospital pretty quickly and of course there was no parking space so Ingmar dumped the car. I had made a sign to say I was in labour but I think it was probably still at home so he left the car, went into the maternity ward, took the lift up to where a midwife met us. She took us into this really small room that had a bed on it and I got on there and she just checked me over and measured how far I was dilated and of course <laughs> I was only two centimetres dilated which when you hear that and you've been in what four hours of labour already and of course with your first labour it usually does take longer so four hours labouring at home is probably quite an average time I've not really looked into that but I was very disheartened to hear that I was only two centimetres dilated and I'm sure a lot of women say this as well I couldn't believe how uncomfortable I was and thinking I've still got another eight centimetres to go. How on earth am I going to get through this? But I did. So she got me into a gown and I asked her if there was any form of pain relief that I was allowed to have at that stage. And very cleverly, she said to me, they have a beautiful suite that will be getting cleaned up soon. And so if I can just hold on until all of that is done, we'll be able to move into that birthing suite and you'll be able to get some pain relief then. It was probably only about 10 or 15 minutes, but Ingmar managed to go off, park the car, pay for the parking, come back, check on me. I was in my gown and we started walking through to the labor suite and it was worth the wait. She asked if we had a birth plan and I kind of explained a few different things. The only thing that was really an issue for me was language. I wanted to make sure that everything was communicated as clearly as it could be, especially because I don't speak great Icelandic and obviously don't have the kind of Icelandic that you would need to converse about a labor. And so I wanted to make sure that I understood the general gist of things. And then if anything got serious at any point, they would all switch to Icelandic so that A, I wouldn't really have to understand and worry about it. I could just focus on the birth and baby and that they wouldn't make any miscommunications at all. I had also stated that I wanted to try the birthing pool and so when Ingmar first phoned up to say that my waters had broke, he requested a room that would have a birthing pool in it. So I was very glad that we got that opportunity. The room was huge, it had a bed in it, it had a huge birthing pool and then there was a counter with the sink and the scales and then the little cot where baby would go and there was also the foot band on the wall which to me at the time didn't really mean a lot but to Ingemar it did because it had the Kenatala which is her ID number and so before she was even in the world and had been born we knew what her ID number would be so I suppose to him that's quite a big deal and now I get that but yeah it's kind of strange that before she was even there she had an ID. I had a whole wall of windows and <laughs> I was very aware that the building opposite was a construction site and so I said straight away let's close the curtains I don't really want to be thinking that anyone can see me I was very conscious of my surroundings and wanted to not just make it cozy but just make it feel safe and make it feel really private because this was not only just you know a special occasion but I wanted to feel confident in this birth and like the room was ours and <laughs> we didn't have any strange onlookers. So we closed the curtains and we just kind of set up all of our things where we needed it to be. I got into my own clothes so I took the hospital gown off and put on, I think I had like a black nightdress and then a big baggy t-shirt over the top. I just wanted to be comfortable and 
then I got straight on the gas in the air and started pacing back and forth. All this time I was doing my breathing in and out colour and that's really something that got me through hours and hours of this labour. If you are someone who is thinking about different ways to cope with pain and to stay calm in your labour and want it to be as natural as possible then this technique is something that's worth looking into. The whole time I was pacing back and forth for I think it was four maybe five hours just back and forth, back and forth. I had the gas mask on, I would take it off to maybe answer some questions, but I really just didn't speak for five hours. I had the mask on and I was walking back and forth. I would stop and kind of hold on to Ingemar's shoulders, put my arms around his neck, <laughs> put my arms around his shoulders, um, stretch out my back as much as I could and then just carry on walking. It felt good to keep walking and so that's basically all I did for a solid five hours, just walk back and forth, back and forth and ignore Ingmar. But I was very much in the zone and really, really focused on what I was doing and bringing baby down and thinking about baby progressing down the birth canal and just breathing the colours. <laughs> that was that was all I did really. It's probably the quietest hours that Ingemar has ever spent with me. All this time Ingemar was updating the family in different chats. He was also speaking to my mum who was now on the way to Glasgow from Edinburgh to get a flight over to Keflavik and his sister was on the way to Keflavik to pick her up so that they would be brought to the hospital to see me and to see Mia more importantly and they actually arrived before she did arrive but I'll update you on that. So it's now 11 o'clock and the midwife had checked me I was now six centimeters dilated so we were definitely getting somewhere and I was doing the right stuff and I just kept walking, kept breathing and just stayed in the zone and didn't speak to Ingmar <laughs> and just kind of got my head in the game and just kept going at that. He was either on his phone updating people or was speaking to the midwife in Icelandic. So they were kind of just doing their thing and it meant that I could just focus on, on me and baby and that was it. They would come and untangle the gas and air tubes that were on the floor. I would just keep walking over them and they would just tangle and they'd come and untangle them. And that was basically all there was to do at that point. The midwife brought over the birthing ball and asked if I wanted to try it. So Ingemar put it behind me. I stood over the bed and kind of sat down to start bouncing on it. I took one bounce on it and it felt like Mia went further up. And so I just remember kicking the ball across the room. I surely did not want to feel like I was undoing any of the progress that we had been making. So she said at this point, do you want to try the birthing pool? And I just said, yep, let's go for that because I knew it would take a while for them to fill up that pool because they're really big, they're pretty deep. So they started filling up the birthing pool for me. I kept walking and it did take a while to get the bath ready for me to actually go into and getting in and out of that bath is an effort as well. It was pretty daunting to have contractions, try and climb up a few stairs, get into a bath and then be comfortable in this bath. It seems like a really nice relaxing idea to have a water birth. All I could think was I feel and look huge with this massive bump. I'm in a lot of discomfort <laughs> with contractions. I'm completely naked in front of someone I've never met before and my husband who are talking away about who knows what in a completely different language. I'm now at risk of, you know, a floater happening. <laughs> One o'clock in the afternoon, I got into the pool for the first time. At this point, the midwife asked if Ingmar wanted to go and get some food because she said things will probably start progressing quite quickly and she would prefer for him to go off and get some food before things got very real. So I said, yep, off you go. Don't worry about it. I'm completely fine here. I've got the midwife. I will be fine. I knew he wouldn't be very long anyway and he literally was two seconds, I think. It's probably the fastest meal the guy has ever had. I think there was a food truck downstairs though, so he managed to get some food there and then just come straight back up. And I probably had only had a couple of contractions in the time that he was away and nothing more had really happened. He asked how I was feeling because he probably felt like it was a long time that he'd been away. And I said to him, honestly, I just felt like I needed to do a poo. 
and <laughs> I basically just felt like maybe I needed to to have a poo. <laughs> that was stopping baby from progressing further down. That's all that was in my mind and I just couldn't get past that point. They said to me, is there anything we can do? And I asked for a suppository and they didn't know what a suppository was and told me that it wasn't available. And I was like, okay, now I'm gonna have to explain what a suppository does. So I had to then get out, climb down the two steps, get a suppository put in me whilst lying on the bed. And Ingmar kept going, not near my head, let's say. <laughs> and I was like, where are you? Come back up here. I think he was just generally intrigued and just wanted to make sure everything was okay, but <laughs> it was just too much information for me to handle. So a suppository in, I waited a few minutes and then they said, right, could you try and go to the toilet? And so at this stage, I was really struggling to walk and kind of hold myself. Generally, you're huge. There is a baby progressing down the birth canal and you're trying to walk at the same time. It was quite difficult. So Ingemar, bless him, walked with me into the bathroom and stayed there whilst I hovered over the bathroom and I tried to go to the toilet, which is the first time that I've ever done that in front of him and I was mortified, but quite quickly, any of that embarrassment just went out the window because yeah, once you give birth, he's seen it all. There's not much more that needs to be said. So I can't even remember if I did manage to do anything, but anyway, we went back into the birth pool and I managed to get into an awkward position where I felt really comfortable with one leg almost up in the air, which is definitely running the risk of a floater situation. And it could happen and it probably did. And I think the midwife is amazing for just scooping it out and just carrying on. I'm not entirely sure if the birthing pool was a good idea for me, but I just wanna put that out there. Before I went through labor with Mia and this experience, I was all for a water birth, but actually it really wasn't a relaxing experience for me. So it just felt like I was not as confident and comfortable anymore and I just wanted to hide. So I grabbed the gas and air mask and just shoved it on my face and kind of hid behind it and just got my head down and kept on with my breathing. The whole time this was happening, the midwife is checking you, checking baby, checking the heartbeat. And at this stage, she said, the heartbeat is slightly too fast. So we just want to make sure everything's okay. We're gonna get you back out of the pool, onto the bed, and we'll just do some simple checks. Everything was very, very calm. And so I naively just thought, we're gonna do some checks and then I'll get back in the pool or whatever, it'll be fine. But that was it, that was me on the bed and it was the last place that I wanted to be to go into delivery. They lay me down, they put a monitor on bump so that they could check baby and check her heartbeat. And of course, the only thing I was concerned about was baby and to make sure she was okay. The longer I lay there, the more her heartbeat calmed. And so I stayed there because obviously you're gonna do what's best for your baby. But at the same time, I knew that this was the most unnatural position to be in. And it was the one that I did not want to be in. I did not want to be lying down on a bed where gravity is against you and it's just really unnatural. I was kind of feeling a little bit anxious about that, but I knew that this was best for baby and so I just kept going with it, kept breathing and just checking with Ingmar that everything was okay. I did say to the midwife, is there a chance to go back in the pool? And she said, not quite yet. So in my mind, I was thinking maybe there is a chance and it might help out because I just wanted to be in a different position than lying on the bed. Off at the airport, Ingemar's sister had arrived and mum and her partner had landed. So they were together. They were headed to the hospital to come and meet this beautiful baby who hadn't been born yet. 3.30 and I'm fully dilated. At this stage, I wanted to try different positions out because I wasn't happy lying down with gravity being against me. I tried to go up on all fours, but it was just too uncomfortable. And I really, I didn't feel like that was the right way to be doing things. So I kind of gave in to lying down, having the monitors on me and just breathing and, and kind of going with the contractions. I really was starting to doubt if I could do it, if I would be able to do it. And it was really hard to imagine giving birth, lying there with these intense contractions that I didn't know how much 
harder and more intense they were gonna get and how much longer this was gonna go on for. I was already feeling pretty tired. Adrenaline was kind of kicking in, but it wasn't enough to really keep me going and the self-doubt was starting to come in. And it was really hard to believe that you can do this and that you can keep literally pushing through to deliver this child. I did turn to Ingmar and I said, I don't think I can do this. Can we ask for an epidural or ask to see if there are any other pain relief options? He translated that over to Icelandic. The midwife had a discussion, came back to him. Then he translated back to me and said, you're 10 centimeters dilated. It's too late, it's time to push. For a split second annoyed that I hadn't been given any other option, but at the same time, that was out the window, it was time to push and the adrenaline kicked in and I was excited. I remember just lying there looking at Bump and thinking, there's a baby inside of there and I'm gonna push with everything I have got and she's gonna arrive. I naively did think that it would be a few pushes <laughs> and she would be there soon, but realistically it was hours of insane pushes the biggest workout probably of my life, every single muscle working to contract and push this baby out of you. And it's phenomenal what your body can do. Yes, you can do research into how to push and you can watch videos and you can ask questions to family members, other people that you know who have had babies, but until you're actually in that situation, there's so many things that are going on around you, but at the same time, you're focused on just delivering this child. It is so hard to know how to push and pushing sounds so easy, but actually it's really difficult to do. Some women will push for numerous hours before they actually do birth their baby. The midwives were speaking Icelandic to Ingmar and Ingmar was speaking English back to me and they just kept saying push in Icelandic or whatever they were saying and he would just say it back to me. And by the time the message was translated and passed through three people, it was just starting to get annoying actually. And so I just kind of blanked out everything that was going on around me, listened to my body, I'd feel the contractions come on, and I basically just looked at the monitor and focused on that and focused on the contraction waves and my heartbeat and baby's heartbeat and just went with that. And that was kind of my motivation to watch those crazy lines go up and down and to just push with every single one of them. Yes, it was closer to baby arriving, but at the same time, it just, I was pushing for over an hour and I didn't feel like I was necessarily progressing. And so I just felt like I wasn't doing it right. And it's hard not to be frustrated in that point because you have no idea if you are doing it right or not. And there's probably not a wrong way of doing it. You have a lot of self disbelief and it does come down to confidence in your body and just remembering that your body knows how to do this and we all are able to give birth and your body, even if you're unconscious, your body can still go through labor and deliver a child, which is an incredible thought. So it's just about trying to remember that and believe that you can do this. After numerous times of them saying, next push and your baby will be here, which is incredibly frustrating when you've heard that for, I don't know, the 20th time or something. Unfortunately, at this point, it was five o'clock and there was a shift change. It went from a lovely, friendly, happy, chirpy young midwife to a much older midwife who had lots of experience, but was a little bit more strict and very direct, rather Icelandic. So it had been 13 hours at this point. I was lying in the bed, not the position I wanted to be in. I had a new midwife. There was a different language being spoken around me. I had been pushing for hours and being told, next push and your baby will be here. I felt really confused, a little bit frustrated, and I was just exhausted. I knew that I had this little bit left to go and that I could just dig really, really deep. And so Ingmar came up beside me, he held my hand and we just said, right, we're gonna do this, come on. I put my chin to my chest, I dug down really deep and I pushed with everything I had. And I can tell you, they call it the ring of fire for a very good reason. It was insane. And it was really quite a surprise for me because 
Although you've had it explained to you what the Ring of Fire is and you know what it is, <laughs> when it happens, it's kind of a scary experience and it gave me a little bit of shock and I was kind of taken aback for a second. And then Ingemar said, I can see her. I asked for a mirror so that I could see her and they didn't have a mirror. So I said to Ingemar, can you put your phone there so that I can just see her? And I put my hand down so I could feel her head, feel her hair. And that was absolutely the motivation that I needed to just keep pushing and pushing. Unfortunately, at this point I tore twice and the midwife then said, I'm gonna give you a small cut so that it helps the baby come out. She gave me an episiotomy and the next contraction I pushed and delivered the head and then I had two more contractions and Mia was born. So 5.25 and I am holding my beautiful newborn baby. They put her on my tummy because unfortunately the umbilical cord was too short to actually get her on my chest. She is just perfect. She's absolutely just incredibly beautiful and perfect, so tiny. She cried and then she calmed right down. I calmed down. I enjoyed the skin to skin. Daddy got some skin to skin later on. Then the next few stages are a little bit blurry but Basically, I delivered the placenta. They held it up to show me this crazy thing that I thought I would be intrigued at seeing and just found it repulsive. <laughs> I was holding my beautiful child and they were holding up this disgusting big placenta, um, which is huge. You don't realize how big it is, but we made sure it was all there. And then they took her, gave her a little wash, put a nappy on her, weighed her, did her footprint as well. And then, yeah, I got more cuddles and then daddy got some skin to skin with her as well. And that is Mia's birth story. I hope that you have enjoyed this. I'm really glad that I finally sat down and shared it with you so that I have it to look back on and Mia can watch it if she wants to. And hopefully it has helped you and given you some kind of reassurance as well because you can do this and it's a wonderful experience. Yes, it is sore and it's uncomfortable and it's painful and it's labor. One of the biggest workouts you'll ever have in your life, but wow, is it worth it. In the next couple of videos, I want to share what it was like leading up to labor, what I did to bring on my labor. And then I also want to share the first few hours of afterbirth and then what it was like to bring Mia home. Make sure that you subscribe to the channel, give this video a thumbs up, and leading up to Mia's second birthday, I'm gonna hopefully share lots more of this kind of content with you. I will see you in more videos soon. Thanks for watching, guys. Bye.